production begins in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Welcome to Community Foundation Spotlight on PAC-14. I'm Spicer Bell, I'm the president of the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore, and uh, through this series of programs, we shine the Community Foundation Spotlight on organizations that are making a real difference in our community. A little special twist today, my guest today is Chris Bitters. Uh, Chris, welcome. Spicer, thank you very much. Chris is the general manager of the Shorebirds here in Salisbury, our very own minor league baseball team. Uh, and Chris, we're going to talk a little bit of baseball, but we're also going to talk a little bit about the impact that the Shorebirds have on our community. Absolutely, look forward to it and being part of the community is a big part of what we do out there at the stadium. So. It really is. I, it, it's, it's always fascinated me. Of course, we've worked on a couple of projects together and you and I are in Rotary together. It's, 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 it, Shorebirds is more than just baseball. Baseball. Absolutely, and we really pride ourselves on trying to support the community that supports us. Um, you know, without the fans, you know, none of this happens, whether it's at our level or at any other level in baseball. And really want to do everything we can to give back to the community and make it a good place to live, work, and play. All right, for those of us who, uh, who aren't real uh, baseball followers, tell a little bit about the minor league structure and where Shorebirds fit into all this. You're an Orioles affiliate. Yep, we're an Ori Orioles affiliate and we're what's considered their South Atlantic League affiliate or, or their low A affiliate. Um, there's several minor league levels that are out there and we're really one of the introductory levels for a player in their first professional season. Um, to kind of start at the top, obviously uh, every major league club has a, a list of affiliates, um, affiliated baseball, and the Orioles are at the top, obviously, and that's the goal for all of our players. They're all signed by the Orioles, and that's their eventual hopeful goal is to make it to the big leagues with the Orioles or potentially become a trade, uh, part of a trade that mm -hmm. would get them to another organization, obviously. Um, but you, know, you have AAA, which is the, the highest minor league level. That's down for the Orioles down in Norfolk, and they've been an affiliate for a number of years now there. And then below that, you have the Bowie Bay Sox, which is across the bridge there in Bowie, Bowie Maryland. Um, after the Bay Sox, below the Bay Sox, you have the Frederick Keys, which is considered high A okay. um, over in Frederick, Maryland. And then it comes down to the Shorebirds, who's considered low A. We're still full season as well, 140 games. Um, below us, you actually have the Aberdeen Ironbirds, which are up in Aberdeen. Mm. And uh, they're short season, so they don't start until June. And a lot of their players are folks from the draft. So players that are currently playing in high school or college now, when they get drafted, um, or players that are down to extended spring training, working out, f honing their skills, would end up going to Aberdeen. And then a lot of players from Aberdeen, um, partway through the year, will end up coming to Dunmarva in the second half of the yeah, year as well. And then below that, there's a number of levels as well, developmental levels um, that are below that, as well as they have some affiliates down in the Dominican uh, leagues as well to develop players in foreign countries. So. Interesting. Neat. And and certainly there have been some shorebirds that have made it to the to the Orioles and, yeah. and other big league teams. Yeah, we have a long list of folks that have made it not only to the Orioles but to the big league clubs. Um, you know, obviously our first year we were flow with the Expos, and so you've got the Orlando Cabreras of the world and the, the Vasquez of the world that a lot of fans remember know from that very first season we were an Expos affiliate mm -hmm. and with the Orioles and we've got a lot of folks like Nick Marcakis, Brian Roberts who uh, you know spent time here in Delmarva as well as a lot of recent guys like Brad Bergeson who's um, up and down, Zach Britton who's uh, knocking on the big league level as well up and down and uh, a lot of players that you'll see and I really think over the next several years um, with the way the Orioles have have drafted and developed players um, and, and those things. You'll see a lot more of our guys, particularly at the end of the year um, when they do September call-ups. Um, we had quite a few last year that were up mm -hmm. there at the big league level. So it's exciting to be able to see them here in Delmarva first and then, you know, a handful of years later, hopefully seeing them in Baltimore in another major league uniform. Yeah, it's, it's been interesting as I followed the team. They're, they're, every once in a while you, you see a player out there and, and they just kind of stand out and you, you hear that's that's one of those good candidates that's yeah. likely to move up. So. Absolutely. you got a lot of good guys out there that you can really tell right off the bat. Uh, Shorebirds have been here for 17 years, I think. Yep, uh, what is, are some of the highlights of that, that, that time here? I mean, really, uh, the 17 years have been a great 17 years. Um, obviously, we've had a, a couple different ownership changes and general manager changes, which I've been here now for six years. Um, the ballpark's evolved as well. Um, you know, when we first started, the executive club on third level didn't exist, and that was brought in a handful of years later. Um, when I've got here, we put in a new scoreboard uh, a couple of years ago, as well as it kind of re-cemented this kids area, which was kind of a grassy dirt area that we made all cement, so it's a little more comfortable out there. And um, you know, and then obviously the players. Um, you know, over 17 years, you have about 50 or 60 players that play on your roster over the course of a season. So there's been a you know tremendous number of players mm -hmm. that have come through Delmarva, some that have went on to be major league uh, you know players on a regular basis, and others that have been here for a few years that the fans really just enjoyed getting to know 
know and meet and you know maybe they're not playing baseball mm -hmm. anymore but uh, a lot of fans still connect with them in, in their personal lives so yeah uh, kind of behind the scenes type of thing what's What's a typical day for a for a minor league baseball player like the, the Shorebirds? Yeah, I mean, a typical day is probably a little different than what most fans think. Um, <laughs> these guys eat, sleep, and drink baseball uh, from the time they report to spring training through the end of the season. And then after the season, they're on to uh, playing winter ball or fall ball um, or working out, getting ready for the next year. But really, you know, our guys um, about noon start reporting either to the gym or to the ballpark. Um, by 2 o'clock in the day, they're um, doing early work. Um, out on the field, specialty work with uh, our coaching staff as well as roving instructors. Um, that goes on during the day until about 4 o'clock when they come back in and get ready for pregame batting practice and infield practice. Um, watching a lot of video, the Orioles have really ramped up their video efforts this year. And we have a video room where um, we're taping guys a lot more than we have in the past. and. You guys are really able to see their their own self on video and, and working with the rubbing instructors, critiquing those things and trying to get better. Um, so a lot of early work's going on up until game time. Mm -hmm. um, so the guys before a game starts have been at the ballpark five or six hours or at the gym uh, working out with our strength and conditioning folks, um, getting ready for a game. Um, then obviously there's game time. They play the game and you know, hype, you know, like last uh, last week, uh, the team left uh, a day and a half ago. After the game, it, I think they left about midnight um, to head down to Greensboro, which is about a six, seven hour drive by bus. Uh, so they got into Greensboro probably at seven in the morning um, yesterday, and they had a game that, that night. Mm -hmm. So they roll in at seven, um, get a few hours of sleep, and then, you know, it's kind of repeat it all again. Back get doing it all over Get over again. to the ballpark and get ready to play that night. So with the South Atlantic League, we had a lot of teams that are spread out. Us on the peninsula, there's only two ways to get off. So we have a long travel schedule. Mm -hmm. um, Difficult travel schedule, so you really uh, get to get to earn the minor league grind on, the, on your season in Delmarva. Mm, so you're you're really, it, it's a hard way to earn your uh, uh, earn your bones, so to speak. To Absolutely, in this league in particular. I mean, we we travel far. I mean, you know, down to Georgia, down to uh, you know. Uh, uh, Savannah, Georgia, Rome, mm -hmm. you know, those type of places, Augusta. Um, so, you know, there's a, you know, a 10 hour bus ride is not uncommon in this league. And uh, if you ever spent 10 hours on a bus, I mean, it's, you know, we got a really nice and comfortable bus, but, uh, you know, 10 hours in any one spot is a good bit of time. So, I guess they hope they're able to sleep while they're. They're riding. Yeah, we do have 12 bunk, bunk beds on the bus that are built into the bus um, that they're usually reserved for the starting uh, players for the mm -hmm. next day. Um, there are also some seniority things that happen that if you've been here before, you kind of pull rank and get a bunk, things like that. But we have a really nice bus. It's spacious. It has 12 bunks. And so that hopefully that group that's starting the next day um, can get some rest on that way down. The rest mm -hmm. of the guys still stay in the seats and try and catch a wink or two there as well. Neat. So. Neat. Yeah. Well, great. Let's talk about the, the community impact of Shorebirds. Uh, you know, certainly Community Foundation has had the pleasure of working with you on a couple of projects. One of the projects was, was a feature project last year. You did the uh, Help Strike Out Hunger thing last year, yeah. partnering with food banks, uh, and, and Purdue was the lead sponsor of that. What was it? What was the impact? How did that work? How, what was the impact of that? It was fantastic. I mean, and we had the All-Star Game last year, which mm -hmm. was kind of the, the build-up behind that and the thought process behind it is take a signature event like the All-Star Game and, and really try to use that event not only to showcase the fantastic players we're going to have on the field, but really to impact our local community, but also broaden the horizon and see if there's a way to impact the communities of all 14 South Atlantic mm -hmm. League markets. Um, wildly successful. Everybody in the league got behind it, all the teams down and, and the other member teams got behind it, the local community got behind it along with our food banks as you mentioned. And uh, I think at the end of the day we raised over a quarter million meal equivalents to help strike out hunger here on Delmarva and through the South Atlantic League markets, which is, you know, for a little team here in Salisbury, Maryland was quite a, quite a feat and um, the game itself was obviously success mm -hmm. very successful and um, we're very proud of what we did and being able to take an event like the All-Star Game and turn it into more of a community focus on top of the uh, play that was going to happen on the field. And, and I really think that a number of other leagues now have looked at that model and said, you know what, this makes a lot of sense to be able to, to give back as part of this signature event that our community is hosting each year. So, yeah, You not only uh, raised a lot of money in, in food that was collected, but you raised awareness. Yeah, you helped to, to you helped to make the the community aware of the importance of uh, helping feed everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was part two of that goal was not only to provide funds and volunteer hours and actual cans mm -hmm. of food to our local food banks, 
but also just to bring to the spotlight a little bit that, um, hey, there's hunger out there. Um, me and you know, because we work with the food banks quite a bit, that it's out there, but really trying to make sure that the, the community as a whole realizes that there's a lot of hungry people out there, and these food bank folks are working very hard every day to try and fill that need, but they can't do it by themselves. They need the community to rally and get behind them, and where our hope was is that if we can introduce some of the community members to doing things like that during the All-Star Game, Potentially, they would continue to do it on their own in future years, um, regardless of whatever events we're holding. But if they did a food drive or interacted with the food bank, that they could go on and continue those efforts on their own down the road. And, and hopefully that was successful. Mm -hmm. Well, and you're continuing that uh, in, a, in a smaller way this year. How is that working? Yeah, very good. Um, this year we're going to continue. Um, we saw the success on Sundays last year where we uh, asked fans to bring out canned food, dry, or canned food items for uh, a discounted ticket on Sundays um, worked really, really well. Um, we, were, we were kind of really taken back by the response. Um, we didn't know what to expect, and uh, we found a lot of fans that already had tickets, season ticket holders or other fans, um, that didn't need the discount for the day that were still bringing food on their own. Um, so we're going to continue that this year on Sundays, where if you bring uh, canned food items, um, you get a discount to the game that night or that afternoon. And uh, the first one we had was just this past Sunday and uh, worked out really, really well. And uh, I think we have nine or ten more Sundays left in the season to continue to to amp that up and uh, you know continue some of the same efforts we had last year. Mm -hmm. So great, very good. And you also have the strikeout challenge for your pitchers too. I think. Don't yep, you? absolutely. With uh, the community foundation as well as Purdue um, Foundation, we're going to continue that effort on Sundays for every strikeout our pitchers record. Um, there'll be a monetary donation um, donated to our split between our three local food banks, mm -hmm. uh, which again is fantastic. That again an effort that was started last year as part of the All-Star Game is going to be continued into this season on its own. And our hopes is that that's going to raise uh, up to $10,000 for food banks. Absolutely. We're hoping to, at the end of the year, be able to make that announcement that we were able to donate $10,000. So we need to encourage our guys to go out there and have good Sunday pitching performances yep. and uh, um, work real hard on Sundays to make sure we raise that money. Yeah, I'd for like those to folks. see those strikeouts so they get into our pocket for some money for food banks. That is absolutely <laughs> for correct. Sure. Absolutely. So, well, let's talk about some of the other things that the Shorebirds do in the community. You have the Shorebirds Community Fund. What is that? Well, it was a fund that we created with the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore a handful of years ago. Um, you know, we get a number of, of donation requests, whether it's for merchandise or tickets for auctions or raffles, and we also obviously get a number of requests for, for cash donations. And unfortunately, we realize that we can't uh, afford or, or make available cash to every organization out there, but we do try to make sure that we take care of them with something, whether it's tickets to a ball game, a hat or a bobblehead, whatever we may have available for them. But a handful of years ago, we decided, you know what, let's create a fund through the Community Foundation and host events throughout the year like our hot stove banquet mm -hmm. and other events that we can raise monetary um, dollars and then be able to advise that fund where to donate those. Um, we primarily focus on youth in particular youth sports events um, with regards to our local little leagues and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, it's our goal every year to host a number of events. Um, this year we, we're hosting a community fund weekend where every game of that weekend will be uh, some sort of fundraiser to raise more funds for that community fund. Um, our launch of all proceeds after the game, a lot of people may or may not realize <coughs> that that money also is going to go to our community <coughs> fund. Um, as well as it was great, Dylan Bundy, who's one of our pitchers this mm -hmm. year, um, just the other day gave me one of his gloves autographed and uh, signed by him that we're still working on figuring out how exactly to use it. But, you know, again, our goal is to utilize that glove and his autograph on it to raise some funds to, uh, again, put into our community mm -hmm. funds. So it's a big focus for us, um, corporate-wide for our company to, to give back um, and particularly host these events to be able to provide monetary donations for those groups that we can support. And you all are big supporters of United Way also, aren't you? Absolutely. I'm involved personally in the United Way, and uh, uh, we've, we've tried to help them through the community fund and the hot stove banquet, um, as well as other events and other opportunities to, again, bring awareness to the folks at the United Way and what they do, because um, they're a great agency, as well as try and provide some monetary donations mm -hmm. there as well. So. And a lot of your, your money that goes out, flows out of the community fund is really focused on youth activities. Absolutely, yeah. We really try to focus on youth activities um, and giving back to particularly again like I said the local little leagues and things of that nature that we can help them uh, helpfully uh, with a few bucks in, in cash as well. So. Great, great. You're watching Community Foundation Spotlight here on PAC 14. I'm Spicer Bell. I'm the president of the Community Foundation of Eastern Shore and uh, my guest today is Chris Bitters and Chris is the general manager of the Del Marva Shorebirds and we're talking a little bit of, of uh, baseball but we're also talking about the the impact that the shorebirds uh, have uh, throughout our community and some of the great works that, the, that they're able to do. Uh, Chris, uh, we talked about youth, what have you. Shorebirds do youth baseball camps also, and they're 
coming up this summer. Yes, absolutely. We have uh, a couple of youth baseball camps that we do. They're three-day camps. Um, one's in July, one's in early August, uh, obviously before the kids go back to school. And um, It's a great day for the kids to be able to come out and work out with a handful of our players and coaches. Um, and our goal is to not only teach them a little bit about baseball, but really give them a great experience to have a lot of fun. Um, it's always neat on the second day of the, the camp. They come out to a game the second night, and they've worked out with some of the guys in the first two days, so they know their faces and know their names. And um, on third day, you know, they come out to camp, say, hey, I saw you last night at the game, good job, things of that nature. It's a lot of fun. It's actually, from an event standpoint, one of my favorites that I actually, you know, kind of put aside my regular work duties and put my shorts and tennis shoes on. Hang out with the kids. Yeah, I go out and hang out with the kids because, you know, with our players, you know, working with them, they love it. Um, mm -hmm. it. It's amazing to see how much the players enjoy getting out there and having fun with the kids and running drills with them and things of that nature. And I always tell the parents when they're out, a lot of players stick around and watch. And I say, look, if, if your child learns one little thing about whether it's effort, attitude, or how to, you know, feel a little better, hit a little better, that's our goal. But, you know, over the three days, really, is have a lot of fun, um, enjoy the camp, and, uh, and her, hopefully learn a little bit about baseball too. So. Yeah, I, I was looking at your website and you got some photos from previous camps on there and I, the, 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 the smiles and the look on those kids' faces, is, uh, is, it, it's, it's really inspiring right there. Absolutely, it's priceless and that's why I sat. I, I shut down for those times and I just get out there and kind of be a, be a kid again a little bit. It's a lot of fun. Now if somebody's watching and they have a, 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 a child of their own or a grandchild or somebody they think might be interested in this, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, give us a call at the stadium, uh, 410 219 312 give us a call over there to the, to the ballpark and we'd love to get you signed up for the camp and talk to Alyssa she's the one that's gonna run our baseball camps this year and uh, like I said we'll get the players involved as we get a little closer and who's actually gonna be out there running the camps but usually once we announce it down in the locker room we get plenty of hands that want to be a part of it because it's a lot of fun mm -hmm. for these guys to, to come out and horse around for a little bit with the guys. Well your players are fairly young and they probably remember when they were doing that sort of thing it, it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago for a lot of them. And, uh, yeah, I mean, our average age, I think I heard from our radio guy, was uh, 20.9 this year yeah. was our average age. was one of the youngest average ages on the league. So, uh, so yep, they enjoy it absolutely. It's a lot of fun that week, those yeah. couple weeks. Now, there's information on your, your website also. Yep, you can go to our website, theshorebirds.com, and uh, okay. check out all, all kinds of information, not only community relations efforts that we do as well as a lot of other programs. Yeah, I'm sure our friends here at PAC-14 will put that uh, website address on the, on the screen for folks. And there is a community button there where that uh, folks can really uh, be exposed to uh, find out information about it for a lot of your community efforts. Absolutely. So, so uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, our friend Sherman. Uh, Sherman is uh, certainly the Wait, the seven foot tall ambassador of the team, I guess. Yep, absolutely. So, and uh, he's really po popular at games. But Sherman does Sherman does appearances in the community also, doesn't he? Sherman is always out and about somewhere. Um, it's amazing how many appearances we do, and we love doing them. And um, also on our website is a form mm -hmm. to request Sherman to an event. Um, but this weekend, a lot of little leagues open up this Saturday, so Sherman will be out and about just like he was last Saturday a lot of little leagues started up so we're at little league parades and opening ceremonies and we have a pretty tight schedule on this Saturday mm -hmm. and, and Friday night he was places and I think t tonight he'll be some places as well and um, we, we do a lot of appearances with Sherman um, little leagues church appearances uh, hospitals community groups um, and really trying to get him out there obviously I know helps helps us for exposure and getting him out there but also I know it does the, the folks that are running these events really enjoy enjoy having them or, you know on their event as well to help bring some uh, fun to it as well for the folks so we're I, glad to do it. I, I don't think it makes any difference whether it's somebody who's young or young at heart they they seem to enjoy uh, seeing Sherman. I know he's come to a couple of events over at the Community Foundation and uh, and people really enjoy having him there and next thing you know they're all crowding around posing for photos with him or getting a high five that sort of thing so if, so if an organization is doing a fundraiser or something like that and they think they'd like to have a Sherman visit they just contact you all at the stadium right? yep contact us at the stadium or like we said before on our website there's under the community tab on our website there's a form to fill out requesting Sherman um, and, and we try to make them all um, if we can be there and it makes you know sense for us to be there um, from a time and availability standpoint, we want to be there. We want to get Sherman. He's our ambassador, like you said. Um, we really want him out there in the community, and we do a number of appearances, like I said, whether it's little leagues or libraries. Um, we want him out there, and so if, if you got an event, give us a call and, 
or shoot us an email or download the form off our website. And if we can be there, um, we're going to do everything in our power to get there to help to help out the event because the more those events are successful, the better off our community is. And um, if we can be a part of that, that's just good for us. So. Great. I, I got a kick out of some of those uh, fun facts about Sherman on your website that uh, his uh, seven feet tall, nobody knows how much he weighs, <laughs> but his favorite foods are hot dogs, chicken tenders, and Cracker Jacks. <laughs> yep. so. Sherman likes to eat. <laughs> He'd have to, to be that big. Um, another area of, of your emphasis, I know, is uh, trying to get kids to read. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a big emphasis for the team and, and, and for myself personally. We have a couple different programs. Um, currently going on, we have our Hit the Books Reading Program. Um, and that reaches middle school and elementary school children all throughout the entire Delmarva Peninsula. Um, it goes from everywhere from Dover down to Accomack, um, from the Bay Bridge to the beach. And uh, we work with about 100 schools and it reaches about 40,000 students on the shore. Um, and it's grown. When I first got here back in 07, um, I think we were working with about 40 schools. And uh, I thought, why are we only working with 40 schools? It doesn't seem right. we got so many more schools here on the shore. And I challenged our crew. I said, look, we want to work with every single school out there to give these kids an incentive to read outside their regular coursework um, in the classroom, to read at home, read books. Um, we all know the power that the reading has and, and folks that, that they can do that. Um, so, you know, now we're about 104 schools. I think it is 40,000 plus students, and uh, it's, it's, it's a huge program for us. I mean, it's really a big program. And then on the flip side, um, we do a similar program um, with the libraries in the summer months. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're working with somewhere around 30 libraries, plus or minus a few. Um, it's fantastic. We work with libraries, um, let them set up the program, but to encourage children to, once school's out, to go to the libraries, check out books, read those books and then both programs incentivize the kids with a couple tickets to come out to a shorebirds game as, as, a, as a reward for them and um, they love it. I know my own two kids when they go to school um, you know once they get their shorebird tickets even though they come to a lot of games every year they're mm. they're amped up and ready to go for those nights when they come out and read their books so um, and we you know I get a lot of response from folks in the community that you know their kids are reading their books and, and getting their tickets to come out to a game so Two great programs that work really well to hopefully encourage kids to read outside the classroom and, um, again, get that reward to come out to a ball game. And we try to recognize them with a pregame uh, parade and recognize them in the stands uh, for the hard work they put in outside the classroom reading books. So. Yeah. Great. And uh, certainly if, if there's some uh, are there are viewers who are not familiar with the program, again, they ought to check their local school and make sure their school is, uh, is, is affiliated with the program. Absolutely. If you're a part of a middle school or elementary school on the shore and, and your school's not a part of it, you got to give us a call and, and get a part of it. Um, or if you work with a library or have uh, in touch mm -hmm. with libraries that aren't part of it, um, give us a call over today and we want to get everybody involved as we can and make sure that we're doing good in the community. Get so. those kids reading. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, it's a great effort, uh, Chris. Um, uh, Shorebirds do a number of uh, activities and promotional programs uh, typically during the season. Any particular promotions that are coming up this season to highlight? Yeah, I mean, we really have a lot of our, our standard promotions with regards to, to fireworks this year. Obviously, I think we have 13 shows, um, which is obviously always a big draw and fans really seem to enjoy. Um, a number of giveaways and, and promotional nights, but really every night you come out to the ballpark, something's going on. And I think some of the nights that we really take pride in are our our nights that focus on on the community. Um, we do a night with Relay for Life um, to hopefully raise money for them, and we did really well last year with a jersey auction um, where they were able to raise money f through a jersey auction mm -hmm. that our players wore at the game. And we'll be doing one again this year as well for them um, in August as they lead into Relay. Mm -hmm. um, we work with the local VFWs around either Flag Day or July 4th game or July 3rd game this year. Um, and we raise money for the military assistance program. They do a great job of doing a fundraiser on their own. But again, we do a jersey auction that raises money to, to help those folks over there in the, the military assistance program as well. So um, those are the type of events we really enjoy doing at the ballpark. And um, every night there's, there's generally something going on that people don't realize that somehow the community is raising money. Um, we have a number of groups that actually volunteer in our concession stands. Mm -hmm. um, and by volunteering in our concession stands, their organization um, reaps the benefit of the sales from that stand. High Voltage All Stars does it. I know our local Knights of Columbus is out there quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and a number, number of different church organizations and youth groups and things of that nature that, that help us out through the season. Um, they're regular groups. So at the end of the day, they're able to raise a good bit of money um, over the course 
course of the baseball season for their organization. So nothing may be going on during the game that you realize we're raising money, but there may be a young man or woman behind that concession stand that's actually earning a piece of every dollar you spend at that stand that night, um, as well as we have our bigger events that you know you see publicly that, mm -hmm. that raise money for groups in the community, like we mentioned. So um, those are those are the ones I enjoy the most because I know not only are we doing good, uh, obviously getting fans to the ballpark and supporting our team, but also obviously giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Now, I know, I know it's not a Shorebirds project, but you also at the stadium have the Easter Shore Baseball Hall of Fame. Yes. Which is a great stop for families when they come to the, the stadium. Yeah, we get a lot of uh, inquiries about the Hall of Fame, uh, the Easter Shore Baseball Hall of Fame that runs it. Um, does a great job over there. It's a unique experience. If you've never been, I'd encourage you to come out to a game. Get there right when gates open at 6 o'clock, and as soon as you come through the gates on the lower level, hang on right, right into the Hall of Fame. And, and really that uh, the museum features uh, ball players and, and folks that have been involved in baseball on the shore. So it's not necessarily so much shorebird base, but more about the players, the high school players, collegiate players, or players that were born here on the Eastern Shore um, that have gone on to do great mm -hmm. things, or umpires, sports writers, things of that nature. And um, you know, back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, when there was a lot of um, what they called you know minor league teams back then, every little town in, in the country had a minor league team. And there's a lot of information about oh, that yeah. in there. It's a great experience. I encourage anybody to stop by and see those folks and very knowledgeable about it. Um, we get a lot of folks from other teams that have. Hall of Fames that they inquire about how it works at our ballpark and it's a great partnership with those folks over there to, to have that and it uh, definitely is a showcase piece. So another reason to, to bring the family out uh, to, to, to the ballpark and, and make an evening of it and uh, enjoy some, some baseball and uh, it's just a great evening out. Absolutely. It really Come out is. and do the Hall of Fame, enjoy a ball game and you know once you're in the stadium there's no charge to get into the Hall mm -hmm. of Fame. That's free or if you have a group, if somebody has a group or organization out there that would like to do a tour of the Hall of Fame on a non-baseball day or in the morning or whatever. Um, they do a lot of those as mm -hmm. well with youth groups and things of that nature. Right. Um, so come on out, give us a call, and we'd be glad to line that up for them. Well, Chris, we're certainly glad to, glad to have uh, the Shorebirds here in the, in the community. They provide a lot of entertainment for folks, those of us who are baseball fans. But uh, you know, commend you and your staff and, uh, and the team for your commitment to community service. You really are making a difference in our community. Well, thank you, Spicer. And again, as I said, we take pride in it, and a lot of most things that we do, we, we always look at that as the forefront of what we're trying to get accomplished. Yeah. So, and as we close up, any particular highlights you'd like to? Anything in the future you'd like to leave us or give us a little tidbit? I, mean, I would encourage you to come out. I mean, we've got a lot of good baseball this year. Some great players, Dylan Bundy, who's the number one pick from last year. Um, we got a young team, but they're a high prospect, high draft pick team that hopefully we can keep them together for a little bit. But come on out and see us and. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, we're, you know, ballpark 17 years old and every day we're working to, you know, plan for another 20 years. So uh, whether it's structural things in facility or whether it's improvements to our operation as a whole. And uh, come on out and see us because every time we're going to experience something a little new. Uh, Chris, th thanks for being with us today. Uh, and uh, you've been watching Community Foundation Spotlight. Uh, I'm Spicer Bell, the president of Community Foundation East Shore Shore. My, my guest today has been Chris Bitters. He's the general manager of the Del Marva Shorebirds. We've been talking a little bit about, a base, about baseball, but uh, the Shorebirds are a significant impact on our community here. They do a lot of great uh, community service, and we've been uh, talking a little bit about that. And Chris, we really do appreciate all the work the Shorebirds do to help improve our community. Spicer, thank you very much. Appreciate you having me on today, and we're glad to keep those efforts up. Great, and thank you for watching PAC-14 and Community Foundation Spotlight. For those of you who are f affiliated with uh, nonprofit organizations in the community, I'm going to remind you to check that Community Foundation Spotlight. We've got some great training opportunities. We have an academy coming up that's focusing on training volunteers, and the volunteers who participate in the academy then will be eligible to apply for grants from the Community Foundation to implement their projects. If that whets your appetite, if you work with a nonprofit organization, you got to get something. You'd like to get something new going or work with your volunteers in a new way, check out our website or call Heather Towers, our Shorecan Volunteer Coordinator at the Community Foundation of the Eastern Shore. We'll look forward to hearing from you. Would you like to see your community organization or nonprofit group featured on PAC-14? 
To get started, contact us at 410-677-5014 or visit our website at www.pac14.org. PAC 14 is a great way to connect with your community.